Ladies and gentlemen, it's currently Monday, July 10th, 2023, although it might be a different date and time when you're watching this video. And right now, Magnus Carlsen, the best chess player in the world, is in the midst of a absolutely ridiculous run in the tournament that he's playing at in Zagreb, Croatia. It's called the Super United Rapid and Blitz. It's part of the Grand Chess Tour. Uh, and at Magnus, at some point in this event, pulled off a winning streak of 17 and a half out of 19 games. He won 16 games and only made three draws, at some point winning, I believe, 12 games in a row. And today is the final day of the event, and I'm going to be sharing some of these incredible games with you, uh, including plot twists and storylines and so on and so forth. Yesterday, Magnus played nine games, and he won all nine, actually two days ago. Yesterday, I took a break from making videos. I hope that's okay with you. The destruction continued. Magnus played nine opponents in this tournament, and then he defeated all nine of them. You literally can't get more perfect than that. Magnus sits down. He doesn't win the first game. He draws the first game, but then he was right back at it. Here we go. <clears throat> Sit back, relax, enjoy your one-way ticket to Oslo, Norway, where we will witness, well, technically Zagreb, Croatia. It doesn't matter where we will witness Mag Magnus absolutely tear souls out of his opponent. D4, D5, and his opponent, the young Gukesh D, plays D takes C4, the Queen's Gambit accepted, and Magnus plays a sideline, doesn't play E3, he plays Queen A4 check, and wins the pawn back with his Queen. Not the computer's preferred choice, but this is a Rapid and Blitz tournament, we don't really care about what Stockfish has to say, we care about a good, easy-to-play position, Magnus develops his Bishop, we have a trade in the center of the board, and both sides are left without C and D pawns. So the pawn structure is symmetrical. Obviously, the, the developmental scheme is not symmetrical. And Gukesh very quickly starts asking Magnus some very nagging questions. Magnus plays the queen back to C2. You will notice that Magnus has moved his queen once, twice, three times, four times, five times in the first ten moves. He's played ten moves, five of them with his queen. As I always like to say, when Magnus is doing this, he gets himself into a relatively equal position, and it's a sophisticated way of inducing his opponents to put his, to put his pieces on kind of targetable squares. Squares that can be taken advantage of. When you move your queen five times in the opening in the first ten moves, you're an idiot. Right? You, we've all been there. E4, E5, queen H5, knight C6. Oh no, scholared mate didn't work. Oh, I'm gonna move my queen again, and then maybe I'm gonna go over here, and then... But when he moves his queen five times in the opening, it's like, oh, wow, well, oh, that's very sophisticated, yeah, he's, he's doing it to get his opponent's pieces out of position in order to exploit them later. I became more British as that went on. Um, it's like golf commentary. Bishop b4, he takes like this, and this is the position out of the opening. Magnus has what we like to call the bishop pair. Uh, he's going to put the bishops nice and comfortably in the center of the board and do something like this where he can potentially target, target this as well. He's giving up the pawn on c3. Uh, he's giving up the pawn on c3 because uh, e5 would be very weak, and also he has this move. And then if the knight takes, we would get this, 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 with some pressing inquiries for the black pieces. Instead of that, Gukesh plays rook d8. Magnus voluntarily gets the literal bishop pair versus no bishops at all. And then he plays f4 to try to break out in the center. And I mean, listen, the position is equal according to the computer, but this looks really difficult to deal with for black. Magnus brings the bishops back like this, laser beaming, rook d4, brings his other rook. I mean, his pawns are together, his bishops are together, his advantage is growing. And let's not forget that he also has a one and a half minute advantage on the clock, which is massive in blitz. Rook c1, pinning, winning, grinning, spinning, swimming. Slowly but surely advancing up the board with his pieces. Gukesh's time is slowly running out, and Magnus lands the fatal blow. Rook takes g7. That is not the sacrifice of a rook. That is a laser beam of an attack by these diagonal pieces. And that's it, because king h8, you can go rook g4, discovered attack, pick up the queen. Or you even have other mates, faster mates. And Magnus got the job done to continue the destruction. He beats Gukesh. His next game, he's got the black pieces versus his training partner, Ivan Sharic, from Croatia. This one is, I think they're training partners. I, I might have just completely made that up. But it's YouTube, you know? Like, if journalists make something up, actually, in 2023, they could do that, too. Anyway, if, like, written authors make something up, that's bad. But on YouTube, I can just say they're training partners, and now they are. So there you go. 
Uh, I'm pretty sure they've done some training together. Uh, Magnus plays uh, a Karo Khan. His opponent plays the advanced Karo Khan. We have uh, a very slow maneuvering game. The bishop goes back to h7, so the knight could go to f5 in the future. Uh, the knight takes on c5. And um, I, I mean, I've played these positions quite a bit myself with the black pieces, and I hate them. <laughs> so I'm very interested to see how Magnus does it. Like, again, like, you put your bishop in the corner, you block your own bishop. If he does it, it's sophisticated. If you do it, it's stupid. C4, Sharic trying to open up the position. And um, Magnus goes for this approach, trying to target this pawn on B2. Sharic backs out of the position, allows this pawn, the pawn to be taken, but... Now he starts an initiative right back into Magnus's territory. Magnus plays b5, allows the knight to c6, and castles completely not afraid of losing the bishop because then he will simply take back with the knight, and his light-squared bishop is going to... That was a... That, what am I doing? There we go. Uh, bishop d3, bishop runs away. You didn't take me? Now I'm not going to let you take me. Knight c3, rook c8, kicks out the knight. Clutch move. The bishop trades, the bishop trades. When you are up material, it's good to trade pieces. And my man is making it look effortless. Trades a couple of pieces off, knight comfortably back. Let's take stock of the position. Both sides have two rooks, knight, and bishop. Same color bishop. One side just has more pawns. And that side is going to use this majority to win the game. All Magnus Carlsen needs to win a game of chess is a pawn. And in this position, he has a pawn on the b-file, and it's very rare in chess that you have, like, point A, point B, point C, and it just goes like this. Magnus plays bishop b4, brings in his rook, doubles up, plays bishop c3, rotates the rook over, his opponent has to sacrifice some sort of material, and that's it. The b-pawn goes. White tries to create a little bit of counterplay, absolutely nothing. Pawn to b2, bishop takes c5, rook a1, b1 coming, Sharic resigns. Magnus plays a Karo Khan, outmaneuvers his opponent, wins a pawn on the edge of the board, doesn't in any way fear his opponent's attack, trades off several pieces, and absolutely effortlessly glides through this game like a hot knife through butter. And there we go. He's won two games again. This is now 14 wins in 15 games. Okay. Okay. Next game, Magnus now has the white pieces versus Vishy Anand, legend from India, d4, and now yet another Queen's Gambit accepted. Maybe Vishy saw what he played against Gukesh, and he was like, is he really going to play it against me? Yup. These games happened like an hour apart. Vishy saw that Gukesh had this played against him, maybe, maybe he didn't, and was like, ain't no way he's going to play that garbage against me, right? So this time he plays knight c6 and e5. This is the top computer line. This is technically the refutation of queen a4 and queen c4. In fact, I've seen this line. Like, I have played this myself with the black pieces, this move e5. It's a very, very aggressive and dangerous line. Vichy plays e5. And the idea is that if you take black plays bishop e6 hitting the queen, let's say the queen goes here, now the knight blocks the pin, and you're going to win this back, bishop e7, and you have a very comfortable position. Okay, you can also play knight c5 hitting the queen. All right, so that's what Vichy does. And I was like, oh, okay, so Vichy saw what Magnus played. Now he's like, Magnus, you're not going to get away with this against me. You might have gotten away with it against the young guy. Not going to get away with it against me. Magnus takes like this. And knight takes e5 actually is a good move. You can play bishop e6 even in this position, but then white can take hitting the queen. So take, take. Vichy plays knight g4 trying to win the pawn back. Magnus is like, please, Vichy, go ahead, win the pawn back. You actually can't quite win the pawn back because I'm going to pin you and then I'm going to play f4. So to defend against that, you need to go here, but then I'm going to go here and then you're going to have to go here and then I'm going to go here and then you're going to have to go here to hit the knight and then I'm going to go here and then if you move your knight, I'm going to go here and then if you go here, I'm going to go here and I'm still pinning the bishop to the king and I'm going to win your bishop. Now in this position, you could go here and then if I take, potentially you have something here, but you don't, not right now. So... Vichy doesn't take. Magnus says, okay, well, now you can't take. Vichy says, I want the F2 pawn. Magnus is like, you can't have the F2 pawn. Vichy's like, I want the pawn on E5. Magnus is like, you know what? Take it. F4. And it turns out Vichy was right all along and actually gets a pretty decent position. Completely equal position. Slight imbalance of the pawn structure. All right? All we have different here is that white has four on this side and black has three. Magnus plays E4, taking the center. Vichy plays h5. 
Preventing white from taking a little space and wanting to control the stuff over here. Magnus develops his bishop. Vichy plays g6. Magnus plays g3. Vichy develops his knight and Magnus moves his king and kicks the knight out of the queen side. The knight goes back and Magnus is like, all right, let's instigate. Vichy castles. Magnus goes here. Completely equal position after 20 moves. And down 30 seconds on the clock. There's no way he's going to win this, right? In fact, hasn't he just lost the pawn? What's he doing? Vichy takes the pawn. Magnus plays e5, looking to play knight e4. Vichy says, all right, come get me. But here come the bishops. Magnus really good with the bishops, as we saw in the game against Gukesh. Knight c5, the bishops are hammering. Now knight d3 check is very strong. Here it comes, and Vichy's doing very well. Vichy's doing very well in this position. Magnus is now under a minute, and he's worse. Knight e1 check is possible. And then Magnus will have to sacrifice his rook to not lose any more material. But Vichy goes here. Maybe he misses it. Maybe he misevaluates it. Now the position is back to equal. Magnus still poking and prodding. It's still equal. 48 seconds on the clock. Magnus goes knight g5. Vichy strikes with h4. But now take, take. And Magnus removes the knight from the board. All the pieces fall off. And it's a rook endgame. It's a rook endgame. Vichy goes for this pawn. Magnus takes on e6. Vichy takes here. King h3. Rook g6. Oh no. Oh no, oh no, and when it's all said and done, two pawns versus one, but they're both passers, the king is going to come join the party, and this is over. Vichy just resigns the game, because if he tries to advance, rook d6 stops this pawn, and if something like, I don't know, rook a3 check, the king just marches up to f5, and the game is over. You're just going to march your pawns up the board. From move 20, from move 30 until the end of the game, Magnus did not lose any time on the clock. He had 40 seconds, and he never stopped to think, almost at all. Gliding straight into the rook endgame, and winning it with rook f6 check, and king takes g3. The crescendo of this game was right here, and Magnus correctly simplified the knight for the bishop, the bishop for the knight, and the bishop for the bishop into a rook endgame. Don't blink. That's three wins in a row. That's 15 wins in 16 games. Okay, somebody's got to stop him, right? How about his former challenger, Jan Yipomnishi, for the World Championship? B3. All right. One of the best ways to mix it up versus Magnus, get a very aggressive position. He can't take because of the pin. Magnus plays d6, playing kind of like a Pierce. Uh, Nepo plays pawn to f4. A very aggressive move. Trying to put something on f3, exactly like this. Magnus castles. Now we have d3. And Jan is going to play bishop e2 and castle and knight d2, and life is going to be good. Magnus strikes the center with e5. This is kind of the issue with white structure is that he's a little bit far behind in development. And if you play something like g3, uh, I'm going to take, and you really don't want to open up your king. That would be very bad. And uh, he goes here, but now knight g4 is pinning the pawn to the bishop. So Jan plays here. Magnus applies even more pressure to the pawn. Queen e2, knight g e5. And uh, in this position, Jan should probably castle long. Because he can, because it defends his bishop, and because then he can, you know, begin some sort of attack and, and throw haymakers. Jan Nipomnishi in this position plays the move d4. d4 is obviously a very reasonable move because it attacks the knight, and after this, this, the position looks really nice. The problem is, white is not castled. And even this very subtle move, pawn to d4, is just a little bit too early to start striking because you are not castled. Your king is in the center. And you need to defend your center while your king is in the center. Knight takes f3, knight takes f3, rook to e8. Suddenly it's a little bit annoying to castle because of this move. How do you defend this? If you play knight d2, I'm going to take on d4 probably. Knight d2, I think I can just take on d4. Maybe I'm going to take with my bishop. Maybe I'm going to take with my knight. As it turns out... I can't really take on d4 because you have this, and you're going to hit this and this. Maybe I'm going to go d5. d5, e5, knight b4, stuff like this. Maybe f6. Well, Jan, after bishop f5, plays e5. Uh, Magnus takes, takes again, gives a check, and just goes here. He's just winning. He's winning because if this, I can just go here. You can't take. If you take, check, and I win your queen. So, if you can't do that, you're just a pawn down. Rook d8, bishop e2, and Magnus plays b5. 
Why? Because of this, rook c8. You still cannot take the rook because of this. If you go here, I have bishop c2 or rook c2. I'm getting to your king. Yanya Pomnishi resigns in 20 moves. Magnus has won four games in a row and 15 out of 16 games. 16 out of 17 games? 5, 12, 16 out of 17 games. He just won four in a row. Four in a row. He had 12 wins before that and one draw. 16 and a half out of 17 points. Yeah, the other two he had from the other day, he was 17 and a half out of 19. Magnus Carlsen won this tournament with three rounds to go. He could not show up to three games and he would still win the event. Literally, he could have just finished this game and left. And I got news for you, he wasn't finished. Magnus was not finished, even with all this. He still wanted to win as many games as possible. He wanted to get a historic, he wanted to have the greatest Grand Chess Tour run of all time. And what better way to do it than with his young rival, the, 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 the young man who he said he would stay and defend the title against, Ali Reza Ferruja. Oh, for this game, I gotta crack my neck. Knight f3, c5. We get a symmetrical structure. Completely bishop f4, Ali Reza goes for the bishop. Magnus says no, Ali Reza goes e6. Bishop g5, f6. Confrontational. He's not looking to repeat moves. If you're, if you're a baby, what you do in this position after bishop f4 is you go back to f6. Ali Reza's no baby. He plays f6, he plays f5. He sets up a Dutch stonewall style structure. He's gonna play knight to e4 and he is going to have at it. Bishop b5, he doesn't care if Ma this is really like, This is what I love about Ferruja. He's like, oh, 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 oh. Magnus is uh, what, uh, 16 and a half out of 17? So what, I'm gonna beat him. Like I'm gonna beat him, it doesn't matter. Bishop d7. Castles, bishop d6. Now Magnus takes the knight so that he can drop his knight into the center of the board, knight e5. Keep in mind, Magnus could forfeit this game and win the tournament. He could literally just leave the playing hall and go to the beach. And by the way, it's Croatia. I mean, the entire coast is beautiful, all right? I mean, I'm, you know, it's not as beautiful as the New York coast, but <laughs> it's a joke. If you go into the water in New York, you will come out a lizard. Uh, castles. Knight to e2, Magnus trying to blockade the dark squares. Ali Rez is like, all right, well, I'm not going to let you move. So this is pinned now. Rook e1, he takes on e5 and plays knight g4. Queen h4 is winning, by the way, because it's a fork. So for example, I don't know, if you try to go here, uh, I just ignore you. And uh, if you take, I'll play here, and then I'll go back and threaten mate, and then I'm going to checkmate you, and it's going to be really embarrassing, and lose your queen. It's going to be really, really nasty, Okay. So, uh, yeah, he's trying to checkmate Magnus, and he's also threatening to win a pawn. Magnus plays the move h3. We have bishop takes e2. The reason why Ferruja did not take this right away is probably he didn't like how Magnus would get, like, a steamroller of a position here on the dark squares. He probably was uncomfortable with this. Knight h5 looking very unpleasant. Maybe the queen comes in the future. So he takes the knight first, and now this, and now knight takes e5. And, and Ferruja is just a pawn up, but the game is not over. Because Firuja committed all his pawns in the game very early to light squares, and now Magnus is going to have a very easy time butchering him on the dark squares. But you will notice Magnus is down two minutes on the clock. He's down two minutes on the clock because he went to the beach. And he came... No, I'm just kidding. But um, he's down two minutes on the clock because, personally, I think it's very difficult mentally to keep fighting for this record when you've already won the tournament. Like, but it's Magnus, right? He'll find a way. B4! You can't take it. It looks free. It's definitely not free because queen d4 hits the knight and mate. Now, I'm assuming Ali Reza won't hang mate, but hanging the knight is just as bad to Magnus. It's still a loss. Pawn to a6. Magnus plays a4. Magnus is playing for a win in this game, down two minutes on the clock and a pawn. This is what you call goat bonus, okay? There is a secret jutsu you can activate in chess. It's called higher rated bonus. And what it means is if you're the higher rated player in the game, if you're the more accomplished player in the game, things go your way. The ball bounces your way. So even though you're losing, there's going to be moments where you can create chances out of thin air because that's just how it works. So Magnus is down two minutes on the clock in this game and yet and upon, and he's still playing for a win.
B5, Queen D4, he's trying to checkmate his young opponent. Rook C2, Queen D4, he's still bullying his opponent. Rook C4, Magnus plays Queen A7, oh my goodness, takes, takes. Knight G6, Bishop D4, the rooks are off the board, but it, Magnus has an advantage! Ali Reza plays H6, Magnus plays Rook C8 check, King H7, B6, trades off the queens, and we're headed for an endgame. E5, Bishop C5, pawn takes, pawn takes. Magnus is gonna go Rook C8, Rook C7, he's gonna win this pawn, he's gonna win the game. This is unbelievable. Rook D7, Rook C8, pawn to D4, Rook C7. Magnus is winning. He's winning the game. I mean, how did he do this? How did he get to an endgame, down a pawn, and he's gonna win? But here Ali Reza plays a very trappy move that loses the game. Rook D5 has a nasty idea behind it. The point of this move is that if you play e4, I'm not gonna go back and lose my pawn. I'm going to go d3, and you can't stop this pawn. That's the idea. But it's a losing move if Magnus plays king f2, and then e4. If you play d3, I go here, and I'm in time, and then e4, and then this, and I'm gonna win. But rook d5 confuses Magnus a little bit. He takes on d4, and then he slides the bishop back. And it's still a fight. But Ali Reza suddenly finds a way to coordinate everybody. Rook d7, rook d5, and oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. They both queen. What's going on here? 10 seconds remaining on the clock. Rook to d2. Is Magnus getting mated? Queen b7. Is Ali Reza getting mated? Rook takes d6. Queen e4 check. And it's looking like a draw because Magnus has queen e6. Rook e6, and rook d1. That's it. But Magnus misses it! He misses queen takes e6! He misses queen takes e6! Ali Reza escapes, he's just a piece up! And in an unbelievable turn of events, Magnus is going to lose this game. Now it takes Ali Reza a very long time, because even though he's a piece up, the threat of a draw is always there. But it takes nearly 100 moves and Magnus loses his first game in like 18 games to Ali Reza Firuja. Now, takes a little while, but finally, mate is unstoppable. The king has escaped from the checks. And in a cruel turn of events, the higher rated bonus ran out. Rook c7, Magnus got to his spot, but this tricky move prevented him from kicking out the rook. He needed to bring his king. And instead of that, Ali Reza's pawn survived and it caused all sorts of headaches for Magnus. And he loses this game. This would have been the, the, the killer game. But okay, he could have just gone to the beach, right? I wanted to show that he was not completely immortal. But we've got two more games. Let's... Magnus immediately trying to get it back against Ali... Re uh, ag not against Ali Reza, that would be very funny. Against Report. Uh, we get a very odd opening with a King's Indian-style Sicilian, a very locked structure. Magnus playing a very confrontational F5, B4, Knight B5. Magnus always looking for a fight, sacrificing a pawn, and just going for it. He's down a pawn again. It seems like he activates his power when he is a pawn down. B6 kicks out the bishop, knight f5, here we go, starting an attack on report, g5 on the way, e4 on the way, very, very tense position, report plays knight e4, bishop d5, setting up the cannons, it's a good position, but there is one problem, white's position is rock solid, in fact, there is nowhere to enter, this is all covered, this is covered, this is covered, report has covered every single square that you can infiltrate on, except that one, but, you know, Magnus isn't going there anytime soon. So Magnus is looking, he's looking. But Report in the meantime is also navigating and trades off one of Magnus' pieces. Let's not forget, Magnus is a pawn down. Last game he managed to create chances because he had the dark squares. But this time he doesn't have many chances. Queen e6, Report plays c4, kicks out the bishop. Bishop b4 tries to kick out the knight. Rook f1 taking the open file. Magnus doesn't have an infiltration spot. He starts to use his pawns. Bishop b5, poking in from that side of the board. But look at this. Rapport is just stubbornly sitting around like, come get me. You got nothing. Knight d6, bishop h3. Magnus in this position does not have to lose a rook. He can go knight f5, pin himself, and find this, pin the knight, and come in with rook d3. 
I don't know if he saw that. I, th this is ridiculous. I mean, it's very easy when Stockfish has to play like this. When the knight is pinned and you're threatening all this stuff, it's not easy to play like this like a human. Instead, Magnus sacrifices the rook. But it's not enough because Report just comes back and he's got the squad. He's got the whole pawn squad still. A4 has to push the bishop back. He loses the pawn on A4, but now a fork, queen g2. I don't think Magnus has enough pieces. Bishop c6, he tries, but he's not calling the shots in this game. Report intelligently defending himself, wins a pawn, has to trade, and this is it. Two rooks and a rook and a bishop. E5, rook a3, here comes Report's king. Magnus is the goat, but it doesn't matter if you're the goat if you don't have the material. Rook c7, the, the pieces are pushed back. Rook b8, rook c8, and that's it. Magnus has lost two games in a row, which was the equivalent, by the way, of going to the beach. <laughs> he could have just not shown up for these games. But every great player ends a tournament strong. And I, I think Magnus really wanted to win that last game, got a little bit over-aggressive. I mean, it's, you can't simplify the greatest player of all time's play to overly aggressive. Like, that's not, you know. But Magnus ends the tournament by playing... Whatever the hell this is, bishop d3 Sicilian, knight c6, e5, trades the bishop for the knight, plays a very strong central setup with bishop b2 d3, knight d2, stops his opponent from advancing on the queen side, and has this very, very pleasant position where his opponent has to play c4 because if he doesn't, he's just going to play bishop a3, so that's exactly what his opponent does, tries to create a little bit of counterplay, and watch how easily Magnus glides through his opponent. Bishop to a3 hits the rook. Takes, takes, rook b3. Now, again, if Lupulescu had not played c4, I don't really know what he would have done. The computer wants him to go rook a8. I mean, I have absolutely no idea what this does. I mean, the computer is just totally out of ideas. It wants to park the car back to where it was for no reason at all like so he tries to do something and magnus grabs the rook hits the pawn on c6 takes the pawn on c6 sacrifices the rook because he's going to get the fork takes trades the queens pushes the pawn wins the pawn and lupulescu just resigns <laughs> just just shakes hands i mean magnus plays a bishop d3 sicilian then puts the bishop on b5, losing a pawn in the process because there's knight here. And the intention was just to damage black's structure. So black just says, all right, I'm going to go here. Magnus like, all right, I traded off my light square bishop. So my pawns are going all on the light squares. I have a very nice bind on the position. Beautiful blockade of your pawns defended by four different pieces. And then I'm going to win your rook. And after I win your rook, I'm going to trade some pieces with you. We're going to trade everybody. I'm going to win a pawn, and you're going to resign. You're going to resign because you have absolutely no moves. You play knight b2, fork. You play knight b6, skewer. Pin, skewer, gg. So I wanted to show that Magnus does bleed and lose every now and then, but he went 17 and a half out of 19 in this event. He won the event by over three points, it was the fourth highest ever Grand Chess Tour score recorded. And if Magnus hadn't lost one of those two games, it, he would have tied for first. So, reports of his death are greatly exaggerated. Not as perfect of a day as 9 out of 9. But as Magnus himself said, today he got 6 out of 9. Which is also nice. It's not as nice as 9 out of 9. But as we all know, 6 out of 9, definitely nice. The GOAT does it again, winning the Grand Chess Tour in emphatic style. Nine out of nine in one of the days. Doesn't get much better than that. That's all I have for you today. I'll see you in the next video. Get out of here.